the most important thing for a martial artist is to have a good mind and a good heart. Hey there, everyone. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 348. And today, I'm joined by Sabanim Alan Burris. If you're new to the show, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to learn more about what we do, to find a whole bunch of other episodes. In fact, all of them, we don't put a single one of them away. No paywalls, none of that here. Just martial arts podcasts. But if you're looking for more than podcasts, we do sell some stuff. You can head on over to whistlekick.com, check out our uniforms, our belts, our sparring gear, our shirts, sweatshirts. There's a ton of stuff there. And you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on every single thing that's there. I had a great time talking with our guest today. We just, we clicked philosophically. There was so much good conversation here. And rather than try to sum it up, because I'll admit, I've spent the last few minutes trying to find a good way to summarize what we talked about. I'm just going to let you listen. I love this conversation. I hope you love it as well. So I'll just step back and welcome our guest, Sabanim Buris, to the show. Sabanim Buris, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you for having me on, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate you carving the time out of your day, navigating time zone math to make this happen. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's certainly, um, it's always a challenge when I do interviews or deal with people on the East Coast. And so it's like... You know, it, it's it's funny, like, well, you know, when I think back, you know, what, what is the cliche in, in pretty much any public school classroom or, you know, any high school classroom really is, when am I going to use this? And the irony is the hardest math in my observation since graduating has been time zone math. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> especially you have to make sure you're going the right way. Right. Right. Manu- maneuvering the right direction and the right number of hours and... And then if you schedule something for after daylight savings time, and then you've got those weird stretches that don't observe daylight savings time and some countries don't do it at all. And it just, exactly it, it is complicated. And so that's why, you know, and anyone that has been on the show in the last six months or so knows Google calendar to the rescue. Everyone that is scheduled to come on the show gets an invite to my personal calendar because that's the only way I could figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good system. It works. It works. Now, of course, uh, we are not here to discuss the challenges of the way we've we've decided to arbitrarily slice up the way the sun revolves around the Earth. That's not that's not what we do on martial arts radio. We talk about martial arts, of course, and that, that's why you're here. And I appreciate you coming on, so we can talk about martial arts. But before we can talk about the things that you've done and the places you've been, we have to talk about your start. So let's go all the way back. And why don't you tell us about your martial arts origin story, if you will? Well, my martial art origin story is a little bit twisted and winding. It started, it started in the seventies. You know, I was a kid and I was reading the Bruce Tegner and Fred Neff martial art books. And there, I didn't have an opportunity to train at a school back then. And so I was at home, a la karate kid with the book practicing by myself the best I could in those early years. It wasn't until early 80s in high school that I actually had the opportunity to get some formal training. And that was in judo. We had a judo club in Thompson Falls, Montana. And it only lasted a year, unfortunately, because of work reasons, the instructor left Thompson Falls. But for that year, I got to train and compete in judo. After that, I went into the military and had the opportunity to train in some karate at Wolf's Karate at Yatkin Road at Fort Bragg. You know, it was in Fayetteville, which is just outside of Fort Bragg when I was stationed there. Then I went to Korea and I went to a little bit of Taekwondo, but was pretty much too busy with army stuff. And I really didn't like Taekwondo as much. So I didn't pursue that that much. I got out of the army and was able to train with Dennis Dallas, Shihan Dennis Dallas, who ran karate, judo, and hapkido classes. And his hapkido classes were very influenced by Japanese as well. 
Mm-hmm. And I went to every class of his that I could working around my work schedule. Then I moved again and I was in a Toshikon karate for a while until that club stopped. So fast forward, here it is, 1995. I'm writing my first book on self-defense and everybody kept saying, what are you a black belt in? And I'm like, well, I'm not a black belt in anything. All of these different schools I trained at, I went up color belts, but never made it to the black belt level. So I said, what art did I like the best? Hapkido, for a variety of reasons. I really liked living in Korea with the army. I'm going to go back to Korea and study Hapkido. And I did that in 1996. Went over there, started as a white belt, uh, and I am still under those instructors today. The last time I saw them was this February. Went over there, got to train with my instructor, Lee jung Gyu, and we got to go see some of the Olympics, as his school was only two miles from the one Olympic park in Gangneung, South Korea. So that's sort of my, my history in a nutshell. Mm. Okay, so let's, let's kind of go back because there's a, there's a point there that I think is, is probably worth exploring, worth digging deeper on. And that's the point where you're writing a book on self-defense and people are kind of, sounds like questioning your your credibility because of your lack of a black belt. Now, a lot of people would say, you know, I don't, I don't need a black belt. I've trained in these schools. I've trained in the military. I've got, I'm doing the math right, around 20 years of experience at that point. So what about this black belt? But you didn't decide just to say, okay, I'll go get a black belt. You decided to seek out Hapkido in the homeland, if you will, and move to Korea. That, that's kind of a big jump. It was. And, and it's true that the, the first book that I wrote, Hard One Wisdom from the School of Hard Knocks, which was published by Paladin Press, it wasn't about martial arts. It was about actual fights that I had either been in or had witnessed during years in the military, during years in uh, the university when I was doing security and different things. So it wasn't a martial art book. It was a book on self-defense based on actual experiences. But there was still always a part of me, ever since that little kid, that was connected to the martial arts as well. And I wanted more of that. I told uh, Sheehan Dallas once when I started training with him, I know how to fight. I've done that but I want to become a martial artist and better myself through martial arts and learn the skills and and everything else that can go with learning a martial art. And that's what I wanted to do when I went back to Korea as well. Wasn't necessarily to become a better fighter, although stuff I've learned in Hapkido has definitely helped me in real situations, but I wanted to be more than just a fighter. And at that time, and, and maybe it's even the same definition now. How did you delineate between a f- what a fighter was or who a fighter was and a martial artist? Well, I think if you learn how to, to hit and strike and kick, I mean, I can teach you to hammer fist somebody in the nose or kick him in the knee or elbow him in a very short time. And you could probably defend yourself against a lot of different att- attacks. Becoming a martial artist to me, it goes way beyond that. You learn skills that aren't necessarily going to help you in an actual street fight, but they help you improve yourself. You go beyond what you think you can. And I really do believe that anybody can obtain a black belt. And it's not necessarily, you don't have to grade a black belt from Joe and John and Mary and Sue, because they're all going to be different. And somebody might not have the physical capability to do what another person can do. But if they are doing their best and they are stretching and growing and learning, then I believe they can advance in the belt system and, be, and they're becoming the best martial artists and the best people they can be. Because it's more than just punching and kicking. There should be character development. There should be you know, the discipline that you go and train 
even if you don't feel like it. There's the discipline to go through a little bit of pain and discomfort to become better. There's the discipline of helping those that are coming behind you to help them reach their best. Um, there's the fellowship that you can gain with other martial artists. So there's just so much more than just learning how to fight and defend yourself. It's quite the laundry list and certainly a subject that we've dug into quite a bit on this show. You know, so you're, you're preaching to the choir here and I suspect the majority of folks listening today would fully agree. It's about that development, that growth that makes it so important. Now, pretty much anyone that's come on the show who has traveled around and, and trained for decades, especially when they've trained in other countries, even lived in other countries as you have, they have quite the collection of stories. So I'd love for you to reflect back on your time training, becoming and being a martial artist, and tell us your favorite story from that time. I think one of my favorite stories is because we watch movies and we see television shows about going off to a foreign land and being trained and such. And after I had lived in Korea, and when I lived in Korea, I went to two Hapkido classes a day and one Qigong class a day and then one on Saturday. So literally it was 11 Hapkido and five Qigong classes a week when I was training. And then I was teaching English to pay the bills. I left Korea, came back to apply for law school. Then that summer before law school started, I went back to Korea. Um, one, to train, two, to see um, the woman that I had been dating when I lived there, who is now my wife. But when I went over there, I thought, well, I know this person that owns a hotel. I can probably get a cheap room, you know, tell them I want to stay there all summer and, you know, we'll, I'll do what I can and make it as affordable as I can, but I'm going to go into debt, but oh, well, it's something important. When I got over there, Yi jung Gyu, my Hapkido instructor, and at the time he was still under Kim Young-jong, teaching out of Kim Young-jong school. Um, then later uh, he left Kwon jung Nim Kim's school and opened his own. But at the time he was still training under uh, Kwon jung Nim Kim Young-jong and the lead instructor. When he saw that I was going to stay in a hotel and such, he was like, no, 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 no. His parents, who he still lived with, this was before he got married, they owned what was called a minbak, which is a small type of inn down by the beach there in Gangnoon. So they gave me my own room, and I ate all my meals with him and his family. And his mother actually did my laundry. She included it with the laundry that she did with everybody. And, and an interesting little story is that one day uh, some underwear got mixed up with some colors. And my instructor came to me one day, and, he's, and his English was not real good. My Korean wasn't fluent either, but we, we made do. But he came by, and he was very embarrassed, and his mom was very embarrassed. And he's like, uh, Mr. Allen, um, and he's like, you can tell he's not comfortable talking about this. He's like, uh, and in, um, in Korea, they call men's underwear panties. Uh, it took me a long time to get my wife to quit calling my underwear panties. But that is something they do in Korea. But, so he's like, uh, your panties? Pink. <laughs> and so because his mom had turned my underwear sort of pink colored by washing them with some color. And so that was just sort of a funny little thing. And I could care less. It wasn't like I was running around in my underwear. Nobody could see him anyway. But it was sort of embarrassing for him and his mom until I yeah. said it was all right. But that entire summer was just so fantastic because I was living with my instructor. He taught four classes a day. So I was going to all four classes every day. Um, wore myself out. There were times he had to say, Mr. Allen, rest. Uh, but it was one of those things that, you know, you dream about or it's in the movies to run off to a foreign land and train with a martial art instructor and live and train there. And that's what I got to do for that summer. That's awesome. Now, one of the things I always ask folks when they've spent time training abroad is how did the expectation match up to the reality? 
it wasn't as tough as some people make it seem like or some of the movies portray. I mean, I wasn't Jean-Claude Van Damme being strung between two trees to do the splits, you know, and, <laughs> and having meat tied to me and dogs chase me through the woods and stuff. Um, but it was still, you know, the people there were so genuine with me and I formed such strong relationships that that was just incredible. I was the only American to train at that school, the only foreigner. And I remember one time Kwan Jung, Kwan Jung Nim, Kim Young Jong telling me, and sometimes he told me through my fiance, now my wife, uh, who would sometimes go and translate some that I couldn't completely understand. But he said, if you, I would have known him in his younger days teaching. I would have thought he was very mean, but times change. And, you know, this was in the 90s. And he's like, being mean is not necessary. And this was a man that was, he would smile. He was happy, genuinely friendly with people. Besides on the mat, you know, we would go out. I'd be invited to different parties and different things with a even though I wasn't a, even a black belt yet, I was going out with these higher ranked black belts and being treated a little bit differently because I was a foreigner and because I was so dedicated to the to Hapkido. And just a very genuine, good person that was very friendly. And when you know, he said, yeah, I used to be mean, but you don't need to be that way. That was a lesson that always sort of st stuck with me. Mm. It's powerful. And I'll say something about, you know, I do remember a time. It was just uh, Kim Hyun, Lee Jun Gyu, and me there in, cl in the room, in the training hall. It was between classes. And, and uh, Kim Hyun is a super close friend. He's the one that helped me. He was my partner when I took my first Don test. And he was like a third Don at the time. And then he went off and he started his own school. So when I go back to Korea... I visit his school as well as Lee Jung Yu's school. But the three of us were there and they were explaining something. And all of a sudden, Kwan Jung Nim Kim Young Jong walks in. No, 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 no. And he walked over. He hardly moved and it floored Lee Jung Yu. It put him down on the mat. And when he got back up, he had this huge red mark on his chest. And it just the incredible power that he had and it looked like he hardly did anything so even though he was such a super nice friendly person he definitely had the power and the ability to not be nice at the times and the only reason he was like that with uh Lee Jung Gyu who's now a Kwan Jung Nim uh Kwan Jung Nim Lee Jung Gyu was th their relationship as the instructor and the student and that was his top student who was doing the teaching in his school and he grew up with some of the mean training and so he still knew some of that but uh, it was just very interesting to see how he could have both those sides and I think all of us have the ability to have those sides and it's sad when you see people all they want to be is the militant 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 and life is more than that you got to have that nice side and you got to be good with people too. Mm. Yeah, when you think about it, even if you extend that that militarism, that let's say aggression into your training, your training isn't even the majority of your life. So to to be able to live kindly. I mean, the when I think about my instructors that I've had over over the years, the best ones were kind the majority of the time. You know, I mean, sometimes sometimes you got to you got to pull out that mean streak, especially when, when you're dealing with a annoying, obnoxious at times child, such as I was. But to be kind, right? I mean, we're we're martial artists. We're trying to develop into better people, as you said earlier. It's true. I mean, I remember once, one of the times I was in Korea, I was going back to Gong Noon with uh, Kim Hyun because he had been on a testing board for a, a different school's black belt test. And when we were driving back to Gong Noon to go to dinner and meet up with Lee Jun Gyu and some other martial artists, you know, he told me the most important thing 
for a martial artist is to have a good mind and a good heart. And that's something that I always try to remember and, and live by and, and teach as well. Mm. I like that. Powerful stuff. When you think about your time as a martial artist, which has been a pretty good chunk of your life, you've developed skills, tools that allow you to face, you know, any number of obstacles. I'd like you to tell us about a time in your life now where things weren't going well and how your martial arts allowed you to overcome. You know, I, that's a difficult one because I think it's the discipline and just the, the training that you can do things. And so anytime that something gets difficult, hitting the gym, hitting the training it has been a part of what I do. And so you know, last year I lost my father, a very difficult time. It's been just a little over a year now. But my father was not a martial artist, but he was a fighter when he was in the military. And I had learned a lot from him growing up. But to incorporate his lessons to the other lessons that I have learned through the martial arts, which he was very proud of me for the, the things I've done in the martial arts, I think that did help me get through that time. And, you know, understanding that what would he want me to do? And he would want me to continue on what I've been doing, training, teaching, sharing with others and helping others in the areas of safety and personal development and growth that the martial arts provides. And how do you think he would score you if he was to give you a report card today? Sometimes high and sometimes low. And I think we always, all of us fail at times. I think he'd be very proud with the newest book that I just published this summer. And so I'd get a very high score for that. I think I'd get a high score for reaching out and doing the activities that I'm doing with the local churches and then trying to even get beyond the local churches in the active shooter uh, response and some of the reflex protect things which is a product that I've been helping introduce into schools and churches and different places. I'd get really high scores for those. I think I'd get lower scores sometimes uh, when my patients, especially with family sometimes. I have a daughter in high school, which if anybody has daughters in high school, they probably know what I'm talking about. It can be a challenging time for both the student and the parents. And sometimes I need to back up and be a little bit more patient and use some of the martial art discipline and the breathing and the patience that we learn in martial arts um, when she's having one of her times. And so I would probably not score quite as high in that because I think I could do better. And I think he would know that I could do better. You know, for, for me, it's always been interesting. You know, I have those figures in my life who knew me well. Most of them that I'm thinking of have passed on. And I know how they would score me, you know, and it, it's funny. We can fool ourselves. But the moment we start trying to step out of that box and thinking, well, what would this person who helped raise me or this person that I respect tremendously, what would they say about what I'm doing? And I think for most of us, it becomes so much clearer, so much more black and white on what we're capable of. I, th I think you're, you're so correct on that. I remember years ago, I was living in Korea, actually training over there. But, you know, I had the internet, I had a laptop and email and stuff. And I shared an, an, a joke. You know, that's a lot of us share jokes. Now it's Facebook posts. But the joke wasn't, it, it had sort of a violent um, ending. And a mentor of mine PhD from Yale, John Madden, who was a classics professor when I went to school in charge of the Honors College, you know, the dean of the Honors College, which I was part of. He wrote me back and said, you know, Alan, does that joke really reflect your values and morals? Um, you know, is that what you want to promote? 
violence over something that's probably didn't need to become violent. And he, knowing that I was a martial artist, him not being one though, he said, is that the kind of jokes that Mr. Miyagi would share? Is that the philosophy that Mr. Miyagi would teach? And when he wrote me that email back, it really made me stop and think, yeah. um, So do I really want to be promoting that kind of thing? And that's why you will never see those kind of jokes, those kind of posts, that kind of stuff come from any of my social media pages. Mm. Makes sense. I like it. Now, when you think about the collection of people who had influence on who you are today as a martial artist, all that, that you are as that individual, if you had to choose one who has been the greatest influence, who would that be? I don't know if I could choose just one because I'm a collection of all of them. Uh, the most influential would have to be Kwan Zhang Nim Kim Young Jung, Kwan Zhang Nim Yi Jun Gyu, and he's actually Kwan Zhang Nim as well, Kim Hyun, and then Shi Han Dennis Dallas. I learned the most Hapkido from Yi Jun Gyu. But I also learned one of the most important lessons about teaching martial arts from Shi Han Dallas. And that's when I first started teaching here in Missoula. It would have been around 98 or 99. And he told me, he goes, Alan, you can teach the physical stuff. No problem. But if you are not teaching to character development and be strong, good people, you're missing the entire point of teaching martial arts and all the good that you could do teaching martial arts in your future. So those are the most influential in my Hapkido journey and my martial art teaching, those four individuals um, with Yi Jun Gyu and Shihan Dallas, probably the most. Now let's play hypothetical. If you could add someone into that mix, someone that you haven't trained with, who would you want to train with? So many people. (laughs) I I mean, that's, I would love to have, to be able to go back and train with uh, Che Young Sul, you know, the the founder of Hapkido. Um, I would have loved to train more than one day with Bong Su Han. I would love to train more with uh, Dr. Kim. You know, I've had a chance to train with him a little, but those are some people that I would love to have had an opportunity to train for a long time with. What would you have, and, and I, I, I'm not great with names, the, the founder of Hapkido, what was his name again? Uh, che Young Sul. Che Young Sul. Do, dojo name Che Young Sul. Okay. What, what would you have hoped to gain training with him? I don't know if his hop keto is necessarily better than many others that are training in hop keto, but I think it just would have been fascinating to train with the founder, you know, if from, from a historical aspect, because right now they're, there's different stories about this and that in Hapkido's history and what the real truth is, is probably somewhere in between some of the things. I just think it would have been historically, if I could have trained with him and been fluent in Korean to, to learn directly from, you know, the person that, you know, Hapkido came from. Uh, so that's, I think what I would have gained. I don't know if the skill, the necessarily physical skills would have been much different than I learned for, you know, when I was in Korea from the instructors I had, but from a historical point of going back to the, you know, the beginning, that just fascinates me there. For me, the opportunity to speak to a style founder. And, and honestly, this conversation comes up the most when we talk about Aikido on the show. 
for some reason, when we speak to folks who have deep Aikido in their personal martial arts practice, it's a discussion of, of Osensei, Morahai Ushiba. And to me, it's what was in your head as you made these decisions, right? Because every style includes some things and excludes other things. And I just find that that delineation to be fascinating. Why? That's neat to me. And, and that fascinates me too. And, and Che Young Sul, you know, his instructor in Japan was Takeda Sensei. So it has the same roots as Aikido, but they sort of went in different directions when Che Young Sul went back to Korea. And then it was some of uh, Dojin and Che Young Sul's students that incorporated more kicking into the art, which is why it has much more kicking than Aikido. But if you go back far enough, they do have the same roots. Mm. That makes sense. Competition is something that, I don't know if I want to say is polarizing, but folks have either had a fair amount of experience with it or usually very, very little. Where do you fall in that dichotomy? I would fall in the very, very little. Okay. Um, in judo, I competed, you know, back in high school. And two tournaments out of the, you know, that year that I competed until the instructor moved away, two tournaments had the biggest influence on me. One was a tournament in Missoula. Um, you know, I was living in Thompson Falls at the time, high school, which is, that's about two hours from Missoula, where I am right now. But the tournament was in Missoula. And it was a double elimination tournament. And I was able to take a first place. I had to go against the second place guy three times because earlier in the day he beat me. And then the way the tournament bracket wound up, we were facing each other again. If he were to beat me, he would win. If I, but he didn't, I beat him. So that made us go into a final match. Uh, the th our third time we had to meet because our only losses had been to each other. And I was able to beat him in that final match and take the first place trophy home. And that was just, it made me really into like, you know, judo. And so that was an important tournament, but probably more impactful tournament was a tournament in Plains, Montana, where I was choked unconscious and why it was impactful. And I've told this story, like in my chokes and sleepers DVD, when I got choked unconscious, as I was going out, and then I was out, I realized that there is absolutely nothing I could or could do as I'm going unconscious. And at the same time, I read a magazine article. And the article happened to be by Lauren Christensen. At the time, I never knew Lauren and I would become friends and that we would be promoting each other. And, you know, he wrote the foreword for my newest book just this last summer. But that article and being choked out made me really devote myself to learning chokes and sleeper holds. And I became very good at them. And I had to use them on a number of actual altercations throughout my army days and um, during security and different works. So that getting choked unconscious lit that fire to me to get really good at those and getting really good saved me later. Nice. One of the things that I often say, maybe not so much on the show, but just in general, when I'm talking about martial arts is that a diverse martial artist is a better martial artist. The more things that we are adapted to handle, the better in competition is certainly one of those things that, gives us the opportunity to, we'll say, diversify. Now, you've talked a bit about self-defense and how it's separate in, in a sense, or at least, you know, not the complete intersection of the Venn diagram with martial arts, and that you've written some books. So let's, let's kind of, let's veer down that side street and let's talk about self-defense and how you found yourself writing on that subject. 
Well, it started probably when I was in the army in Korea and I read Mark McYoung's first book, The Cheap Shots, Ambushes and Other Lessons. And I read Peyton Quinn's first book, A Bouncer's Guide to Barroom Brawling, you know, both from Paladin Press. And reading those books, I was like, I'm seeing this same kind of stuff down in the bars. These guys are are, they're talking sense because I'm experiencing the same thing. When I got out of the army and I was in college, I wrote Mark McYoung. And, you know, this is back before email and the Internet. It was a real letter. And he wrote me back. And we started writing letters. That turned to phone calls. That turned to him actually coming up to Montana. I was a student at the University of Montana. And through some groups that I was in, we were able to host him to come up and give a crime avoidance seminar for students. So when he came up, we spent a bunch of time in the gym training together. And then I actually helped him, assisted him giving that crime avoidance seminar to the campus. And I told him about the idea that I had about Hard One Wisdom, the book I wrote. And he was like, that's a good idea, write it. And so I ended up writing the book. He ended up helping me uh, edit it a little bit, gave me suggestions, and he wrote the foreword, and Paladin Press ended up publishing that book. And that was my first book and my introduction with Paladin Press. And what is it that you like about writing? Because we've had a number of authors on, and they've all spoken very fondly about the process and the production of a book, but they've also spoken very much to the the challenge and and the rarity of seeing any kind of reasonable financial return from from the time they invest. I like the aspect of being able to share something with others that may help them, whether it's the book on active shooters or self-defense, or if it's one of my tough guy wisdom books or my novel, they just get some enjoyment out of it. I like that aspect that, you know, something that I can produce and share with others that will benefit them in some way. And there's a little bit of the, the vanity that, you know, I like seeing, wow, you know, go to Amazon and wow, there's 11 DVDs and half a dozen books and, you know, being, wow, you got some stuff out there. You're, you're getting out there. I, I like that. I don't like the long hours sitting by yourself just be laboring over something because you just can't quite get it right yet. Um, I don't like the editing process and going through stuff over and over to make it better and to find little mistakes and hope that you find them all. And then you publish a book and you find that other mistake that you missed those first 20 sometimes. But overall, I mean, it's a satisfying feeling to actually hold a book that you created. There's a lot of overlap with the mindset, it seems, that goes into a book as martial arts training. There is. You know, when it comes down to it, to write a book, you know, it's a very simple formula. Put your butt in a chair and start typing. I mean, that's what it takes. And and it takes a lot of discipline to, to make sure you do that consistently. To the end, there, like martial arts, I am sure there are way more people that have started a book, just like there are tons of people that start martial arts than those that actually complete a book or those that obtain their black belt. There's that stick to itness that is needed for both. Mm. I'm sure you're right. I'm sure if we were to dig up some numbers because you know pretty much anybody everyone has said that they're writing a book at some point i've said i'm writing a book i've I've actually written a couple small ones but i've said i'm writing far more there are far more ideas in my head than even half finished books so if we were to let's let's dig into the self-defense a little bit because self-defense is a pretty controversial topic within the martial arts because so many outside of the martial arts equate martial arts with self-defense. We seem to have taken up this 
mantle in a sense to say, if you want to learn self-defense, you should come to a martial artist. And of course, that is not the only way. And sometimes because of the the intersection of, of, of self-defense and martial arts, there are some folks who are great at teaching it and others who are less so. But if we were to talk about the difference between your perspective on martial arts and your experience and what you teach, what you write about versus some of the, I don't know, maybe the cliches or the widely held beliefs, you know, what myths might you bust for us, for the listeners today? I think one of the big ones is that you have to become a black belt or that you have to train for years upon years to be get proficient to defend yourself. Um, and because there are those out there that say the short courses, they're not worth anything. And I, I think that's complete BS. Um, I, I remember Tony Blauer talking on an interview once where, because he does a lot of short courses, and he has had people in his short courses defend themselves and it was because of those short courses that gave them the skills and tools they needed. So don't tell Tony Blauer that short courses don't work because he has proof they do. And he's just one example. We could probably find a whole bunch more. I just, his name came off the top of my head because I remember that interview. I have taught a ton of short courses. And I think a lot of them, if you can get people's mindset changed, and get them thinking differently, that's one of the most important things you can do. And then you teach them just a couple physical tools with the right mindset and a couple physical tools, people can defend themselves enough to get to safety in most of the things that are happening to people. And if they have the right mindset and awareness, they can avoid a lot of the violence that happens in the first place. I get it. I get it. Now, let, let's, let's kind of open that subject up a, a little bit. If folks were to, and, and I hope some of them will, pick up your books. And of course, this, this is a good time to, to mention, we're going to have a bunch of links, a bunch of things over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So whether you're new or not to the show, you may not know that, may not remember that. Go ahead, head on over. You can check out some of Subonim's books and links and everything. So if we consider the catalog of material that you've produced what other things you know give us a few other hooks you know what what other things can we share with the audience that might excite them about checking out some of the other things you've written well you know i'll look at my dvds first okay you know, i have dvds on you know street fighting essentials which was out by paladin press and that teaches basic striking bakes basic kicking you know things that you can learn pretty fast but then if you go into my lock on joint locking series with Ike Productions, that's all about joint locks. Joint locks are going to take longer to become proficient enough to use them. It doesn't take much practice to be able to hammer fist somebody in the nose. It takes a lot more practice to be able to joint lock and escort somebody out. And so depending on the skill set and your goals, do you need a short self-defense class that teaches awareness in a few schools? Do you need a longer course that will teach you skills to, in, for law enforcement or bouncing where you have to escort and maybe use joint locks in that arena? Or do you want to become a martial artist and learn a plethora of skills, some which you will never need on the street, but you will become a better person? a more disciplined person, a more educated person on how the body works and why joint locks or other different you know, pressure points or whatever skills you're learning throughout the martial arts, why they work. It just encompasses so much more. And it really is a lifetime worth of studying that you can keep learning and improving and growing and adapting and changing as you age because you can't do the things in your 50s, 60s, 70s that you could when in your 20, you know, teens, 20s, and 30s. So you have to learn to adapt and change and still continue that growth. 
So the martial arts and some of the products that I, I have put out, that's for that long-term growing and becoming a better person, better martial artist. Other things are for the short term. You need to learn something so you're safe out in the parking lot, or you need to learn a skill if a crazy person comes in and starts trying to kill people and you have to respond. And that's why I teach these things through different websites and do try to keep things a little bit different, although there are some people that want it all sort of like me. I want to be the best at self-defense, but I also want to grow as a martial artist. Great. I love it. Let people know, even though I said we're going to drop the links in, why don't you just let folks know where they can find some of your, your things, your DVDs, your, your books, etc. For martial art related things, yourwarriorsedge.com. I have, you know, videos on martial arts. I have the videos for sale. I got the free stuff. I have a blog that focuses more on martial arts, martial art philosophy and such. If you go to surviveanddefend.com, that focuses on safety and self-defense more. And so that blog has a different goal. And there's also a membership site with, there's now close to 650 different pages of videos, audios, written things that are all on keeping you safe. Then I have surviveashooting.com. That is specifically for active shooter and terrorist threat situations and things you can do beforehand, during, and after that will save lives. Nice. And each of those websites has a corresponding Facebook page as well that includes articles and posts about those specific topics. Okay, great. And again, folks, you know, we're going to link, link those for you. So no need to write on the back of your arm or crash into a tree while you're driving. When you look out over your next, however long you choose to spend training, and I'm assuming that it's not going to stop. Very rarely do our guests plan. In fact, never has a guest admitted or, or said, even speculated that they would stop training at some point. So when you look out over your future, what, what are your goals? Are there, are there definable things that you're striving for with respect to you know, your personal training or your professional work helping others? I want to keep training, keep writing, keep teaching, and keep, keep helping others on their journeys, whether it's in the staying safe and self-defense or their martial art journey. And that's going to change some, and some might be more mental than physical as I age. Um, I'm, I'm very fortunate for the last six or seven years, I've been one of the instructors at the Korean Martial Art um, Festival in Crestview, Florida. A fantastic uh, three-day event every April. And there's just some fantastic instructors. And the last couple of years, Dr. Hae Young Kim has been one of the instructors. Um, this last spring when I was down there, besides teaching my class, I like to go to all the other instructors' classes that I can and, and learn from them. Dr. Kim's class, he held up a couple magazines. He held up a magazine from back in the 70s or so when he was on the cover doing this super high flying kick. And he talked about when you're young, you can do all these physical things. And, you know, I could jump very high. Then he held up a magazine. I think it was from the 80s, 90, or no, it was probably the 90s or so. He was on the cover, and he was doing more of a throw or a joint lock technique. And he talked about how when you get older, sometimes your techniques start to change. Maybe you can't jump as high, so you do something different. And then he held up a magazine cover from sometime in the 2000s, and the article and the, the feature about him was more on the, the mental aspects of training. And he talked about, you know, as you get older still, your training goals and what you're doing changes. And now this is a man that he was 80 years old. He's 80 years old. And he was out there teaching joint locks and running a seminar session. But I found that interesting when he held up those magazines and talked about how we change as we age, 
we don't stop, but we do have to modify and do things maybe differently. And maybe our focus will be different of what we do in, in the arts. And so I hope I'm teaching when I'm in my 80s, like he is. And I understand that things are going to change. Uh, in my 50s now, I'm different from when I was in my 20s, 30s. And it's going to keep changing. But I think martial arts will slow the changes. Um, continued practice will help slow the aging and will help me age better. And hopefully those are lessons that I can pass on to others so they can train and age more slowly and better and have longer journeys in the arts. Great, great stuff. I really appreciate your time today. I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your stories and just being so open with the audience. It, it's meant a lot to me. So if I could ask you just one more favor, if you could send us out with some parting words or something poignant, what last words would you offer to the folks listening today? I think I would just have to repeat the words of wisdom given to me by uh, Kim Hyun on that drive in Korea a few years back. To have a good heart and a good mind. That's the most important thing that we can do as martial artists and as people. Um, to have a good heart and a good mind. That's really the key to life. I, I really think it is. And I think a lot of the stuff that we see going on in the world right now, so many people fighting and mad and angry with others over different ideas or over this or that. If we could just stop and, and have open our hearts and have good hearts and good minds and do our very best to, to help other people then I think we, we would have something. And I think as martial artists, we should have the discipline, the skill sets, the abilities to do that. Well, I, I was going to mention, I mean, I, for an actor, obviously, I, I watch tons of movies, but I'm still a huge Chuck Norris fan. And an interesting little story is when I met Chuck Norris a few years back, my wife and I went to a book signing when he was promoting that against all odds. Um, and I'm standing in line with a bunch of other people. And I, I look over there and I tell my wife, that's Howard Jackson. And she's like, huh, who? I said, the man standing over by the table by Chuck Norris and his wife, that's Howard Jackson. He's actually a really good martial artist too. And I said, wait a second. And I opened the book that I was holding in my hand that I was going to have, you know, buy and have him sign. And I looked through it, and there was a picture of uh, Howard being kicked by Chuck Norris in a scene from one of the movies they did together. I said, that's him there, right there. So I get up. Um, Chuck Norris signed the book and, you know, talked to him for briefly. And uh, then I went over and started talking to Howard, and I had him sign that picture in the middle of the book. So my, my book, Against All Odds, is signed by both Chuck Norris and Howard Jackson. And then when the crowd left, Howard and I went back over to where Chuck was and I got to talk to him a little bit longer and stuff. Uh, but, but yeah, I just thought that was, so that's sort of a special, you know, I have 500 or more signed books in my book collection, but that one's sort of special because it's signed by both of them. When I talk to folks like Subhanim, I get the sense that we're in the midst of this movement of traditional martial arts moving forward understanding its place in the world today, understanding how much of an impact we can have on ourselves and on others in and out of the martial arts. And that really excites me. So thank you, sir. Thanks for coming on the show today and helping me feel better about the world. If you want to check out the show notes with transcripts and photos and videos and links to social media, a ton of stuff. In fact, a lot of stuff today. <laughs> Head on over, whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. You get links to books and DVDs and all kinds of cool stuff that this man puts out. It's great. And just, I say it every once in a while, I'm going to say it again. We receive absolutely no compensation or kickbacks for any guests coming on the show, for any products that you may purchase from them. We're just trying to help share. If you want to check out what we do, the things that we share, 
You can find those at whistlekick.com, use the code podcast15, or head on over to Amazon. If you want to find us on social media, that's at Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Those are our main platforms. And you can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you have a suggestion for a guest, there's a form on the website, on the Martial Arts Radio website. Fill that out, and we'll be in touch. Whether that's you or somebody else, we, we want to talk to you. We want to know what your stories are. That's what makes this show so special. And that's what I've got for you today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.